Welcome back to Judgment Decision Making. I'm Dr. Padilla. Now we're going to talk about the fourfold pattern that will help us understand some of the specifics of prospect theory. Now to begin, we need to understand that we assign weights to specific characteristics, meaning that when there's many factors that go into our decisions, some we weigh more highly in our decisions. If you're going to buy a car, for example, you might weight the gas economy, the comfort, or the appearance of the car over other things, um, such as the safety. <laughs> um, so that's to say that the things that we include in our decisions have weightings based on how we value the individual components. Now, this has to do with um, the expectation principle, which is a little bit in violation of what we just talked about. The, ex the expected value of a gamble is the average of its outcome, each weighted by its probability. So if we do not apply any emotional information to um, how we evaluate gambles, the way we would do it would be mathematically. So for example, if you had a 20% chance of winning $1,000 and a 75% chance to win 100, you can do a calculation to determine the expected outcome of these two gambles. The way it would work is you would multiply the probability based on the outcome, so $200 in this version, and for all subsequent probabilities, and then you add them together and you get the expected value. So in this case, the expected value of this particular gamble is $275. Were you able to get that in your mind? Um, so that's to say that if humans were robots, this is how we would calculate the expected value of a gamble. Now, the expectation principle does not correctly describe how we think about probabilities related to risky prospects. We don't think like robots. Instead, we use heuristics and apply value and emotion to different probabilities. So for example, imagine that your chances of receiving $1 million improve by 5%. That's fantastic, right? The expected value, if we calculated it like in the previous slide, would be $50,000. But now imagine I show you scenarios where your, your value is changing from a set value. So for example, in A, you had a 0% chance of winning a million dollars, and then you went up to 5%. In B, you had a 5% chance of winning a million, and it went up to 10. In C, from 60 to 65. And from D, from 95% chance of winning a million dollars to a 100% chance of winning a million dollars. Which one of these feels better? Which one would you rather take on? Well, most people would probably take this one on. Getting a 100% chance of winning a million dollars feels pretty great. The other one people tend to know is this one here. This is when you go from no chance of winning a million to 5%, right? You had no potential of even getting a million and then you have some likelihood. There's some hope now that you have that you could actually win a million dollars. But the expectation principle suggests that you, the utility is only increasing by 5% in all of these. So if we were robots, we would treat all of these changes in probability exactly the same because the expected value for all of them is completely equivalent. But as you can see, they don't feel equivalent. So in the example where you increased from 0% to 5%, it's illustrating this possibility effect, which causes highly unlikely outcomes to be weighted disproportionately than they deserve. So we add more value to a scenario where we go from no likelihood to some more than you know 60 to 65. We add additional weighting to those. And what you'll see is that what I mean by weighting is that we tend to engage in gambles like this. So we might buy a lottery ticket that increased our chance from zero if we didn't buy a lottery ticket to 0.005%, right? So we're willing to pay some money 
to get some amount of probability way more than the actual expected value of that gamble. And in the, the final version, going from 95% to 100, that's an example of the certainty effect. And that's when we overweight the potential to get a sure thing. If we have an opportunity to gain something and then someone gives us an opportunity to have a sure thing on that gain. So if we can go from 95% probability to 100%, that looks very, very desirable to us. And we tend to overweight situations like that. Okay, so examples of the uh, possibility effect include you know, any lottery tickets, anytime you enter a contest to potentially win. Here's an example where you um, can enter to meet Beyonce all of these have very sm small probabilities of actually winning, and we pay more than the expected value of these particular gambles. But we're paying for the opportunity, we're paying for the experience to try because it feels fun to do so. And that's really what we're talking about here. The possibility effect is the positive feeling we get by having the potential to win something very important to us. Now, the certainty effect, I'll illustrate in this example here. The chance of being audited is 0.5%, and the average taxes owed, if you get audited, is $3,500. Now, H&R Block offers this peace of mind plan, which is extended service that costs about $60. And the way that these extended um, service plans function is if you get audited, they will protect you. So you go from a 0.5% chance of being audited to a 0% chance of being audited. So do you take it? Do you spend $60 on this plan? Well, if we actually calculate the value that H&R Block is getting, let's pretend that 100 people file with H&R Block and 60% buy this piece of mind plan. And that those are from some rough, rough estimates that I uh, found online. So the profits to H&R Block would be 3.5 million. And let's imagine that 5% of people, 0.5% of people actually do get audited. So that would cost H&R Block 1,700,000. Uh, so they would make this profit here, which is a massive profit. And that's essentially if they're just paying for you getting audited. Instead, they can get some more of their money back if they can help fight the audit system and then they would actually have to pay less. So interestingly, if everyone actually just pays, in this example, $17.5, we're essentially paying for the entire value that goes to the IRS and then H&R Block doesn't have to um, get any profits really. So by simply paying a little bit more across everyone, we eliminate the risk. <laughs> we could eliminate the risk to everyone um, and really eliminate the whole function of the IRS. So I'm just trying to illustrate that, you know, before you saw me kind of break down all of these numbers, you might think that this extended service peace of mind plan is actually a good idea. I've purchased it in the past. My husband almost always <laughs> tries to get it because it feels good to, to know that you have a 0% chance of being audited. And that's what they're selling. They're selling the feeling of security and the feeling of comfort. And we will pay a premium for that feeling. Okay, and so they developed this really fantastic four pattern grid to help us understand the relationships of gains and losses for high and low probabilities. So if we start here with the high probabilities, I'm just pointing out the two that are related to high probabilities. They are 95% chance of winning 10,000 and 95% chance of losing 10,000. And these relate to the certainty effect. And here on the bottom row, this is a low probability event where there's a 5% chance to win 10,000 and a 5% chance to lose 10,000, okay? And now I'm gonna walk through each of these and give you some examples of um, situations that pertain to each. And note that I, I want you to pay attention to the differences in risk aversion versus risk seeking behaviors 
as we go through this. Okay, if we look at the first one on top, this is illustrated by a high probability event of you gaining money. And so this is kind of illustrated when people are averse to risk, when they consider the prospect of a substantial chance to achieve a large gain. So in this block, people are risk averse. They are willing to accept less than the expected value of a gamble to lock in a sure gain. So imagine you were going to win a court case where um, you had a 95% chance of winning the case. And if you won, they would give you $10,000 because maybe you got injured in a car accident or something like that. Now, people are afraid of losing that $10,000. And so what tends to happen is they'll make a settlement. They'll agree with the other party that they'll take $9,000 or $8,000 and not actually go to trial because they don't want to risk the potential of not getting that $10,000 that they really want. So that's an example of being risk averse in this high probability of gains grid here. Okay, if we drop down to this lower row, this is when you have a 5% chance to win $10,000. And this is where we would be risk seeking. So an example is when the top prize is very large, ticket buyers appear indifferent to the fact that their chance of winning is minuscule. They buy the right to dream. So for example, let's say that you had a ticket that gave you a 5% chance of winning $10,000. That is pretty good, right? But say I wanted to buy that from you for $501. Would you sell it to me? Most people probably wouldn't. They want the chance of winning $10,000 and 5% is pretty good. But the expected outcome is actually higher if you sell it to me for $501. It's $1 more than the, the, the expected outcome. So it would be smarter to sell the ticket to me. You would have higher likelihood of getting profit in that case, but you'd probably keep it because you want the right to dream. Maybe you get that $10,000 and that would be fantastic. Okay, the next example is an example of risk aversion. This is when there's a low probability event of losing money. So there's a 5% chance of losing $10,000. This is a fear of a large loss. An example is that people are willing to pay much more for insurance than expected values. They eliminate a worry and purchase peace of mind. We already talked about one example of this, um, but I think another interesting one is a lawyer's retra retainer fee. So in this example, let's say you're going to court and there's a 10% chance you'll lose the case and you will owe $10,000. So what do you do? You probably hire a lawyer, right? To reduce your chance, hopefully to zero. The initial payment you have to make to a lawyer is around $1,000 and that's already double the expected outcome of this gamble here, right? And you might pay $3,000, $4,000 to that lawyer to avoid the small chance of having to pay the larger amount. That's just one of many different examples of this uh, risk aversion that we have for these low probability events um, of, of losing a large sum of money. Okay, and the last one, this is maybe the most <laughs> sad uh, um, square in this grid, but it is when there is a high probability of losing, we tend to be risk seeking. So this is really what you're seeing in big casinos capitalizing on. It's essentially when people are faced with bad options, they take desperate gambles, accepting high probability of making things worse in exchange for a small hope of avoiding a loss. A defendant with a weak case is likely to risk to be risk seeking, preparing to gamble rather than accept a very unfavorable settlement. This is the double or nothing approach. You've already lost a ton of money. Why not try it again? Maybe there is going to be a little bit of hope that you make it on top. And this is when people get into really bad situations where they're risk seeking when they face a high probability of losing large sums of money. Okay, a summary here. We have the fourfold pattern that we just learned about. 
which is a framework that helps us understand how we evaluate perspective gains and losses. And this involves the possibility effect, which is uh, causes highly unlikely outcomes to be weighted disproportionately more than they deserve. And the certainty effect, when we overweight the sure thing. Thank you.